If you are here with your mother today and you're visiting with us, we want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being here with your mom. Uh, I, I know that I miss my mom and, and that I wish she was here with me and that's a, a way that a lot of you feel. Uh, mom has been gone, whether it's a year or five years or 10 years or more. Um, that, that can be something where there's kind of a hole in your heart on this day. And if that's you this morning, um, I feel you. I'm with you there. And so, and then some of you had the kind of mom that, that maybe it wasn't always easy for you. If that's you this morning, I want to say, I I'm sorry for that. And that, that we feel what you may be going through on this day. Maybe you had a mother who was the best mother, literally the best mother that you could ever have. That's a great thing. I used to stand up in front of the church and say, celebrate all the mothers because it's a great thing. And some people would occasionally come and say, my relationship with my mom was not what it, what it needed to be. And this is a painful, painful day. You know what? I want to acknowledge that. And I want you to know that you have a heavenly father who can stand in the gap for you. And we're going to say the same thing around Father's Day. Or maybe you had that situation where dad wasn't the best dad. So I know that we get in here and I want to say thank you to, to the mom of my children. Thank you, Jessica, for all that you do for my kids. We tried to clean the house. It didn't work. We, we, we tried not to fight and it didn't work. But we love you guys and we're thankful. We're thankful. If you're here for the first time with your mom or, or maybe just visiting, we're in a series called Favor with Kings. It's the story of Nehemiah. And um, we've been going through this journey for the past three weeks. We're about halfway through. We've got three weeks after this. And what we want to do is have you remember this phrase. If you remember, with it, if you remember it with me, I'm not going to put it on the screen. But if you remember it, shout it out with, with me. You have a mission from God that motivates you and matters to someone else. Okay? You have a mission from God that matters to you, motivates you, and matters to someone else. See, I got it wrong. Okay? I, I didn't put it on the screen because I wanted to kind of test you. Okay? You have a mission from God that motivates you and matters to someone else. Love that, okay? You can post that on Twitter if you want. Last week, what we wanted you to hear is that when the calling is clear, when you get your calling, when you get your mission, when you get the task that God has for you to do, it's time to leave the castle. And that is when reality begins to set in. When you start to, did I say something wrong? When, when reality sets in, that, that's when you begin to leave security and exchange it for possibility, okay? Nehemiah had a cush job. Do you remember that? And, and so here, here's something. Uh, I, I have a friend of mine who is kind of a mentor to me. I meet with him uh, once every week or once every week or so. He just recently left a, just an amazing job. And, and God decided that it was time for him to leave that job and go do something else. But there was something that he had to do. He had to leave something that was secure. It had, it had steadiness to it. And he had to leave it to go to something that may be less secure. Maybe had more possibility, but was certainly less secure. And if you've ever been a part of that journey in your life, you know that taking that first step can be terrifying. You know that it can be thrilling but terrifying. Imagine being a, a, another guy. Uh, it's Mother's Day, so I'm using all the guy examples today, okay? Imagine another guy who, who decides to join a blended family and try to raise kids who are not his own. And the journey that that takes of leaving maybe the security of what he's known before and starting something brand new. Here's what I want you to see this morning. You have favor with those kind of influencers. As you leave one thing and you step out into another thing, you're going to be able to leverage what God is doing inside of you and the mission that he's created inside of you to affect others. One of the things that we want you to start working on right now is developing this kind of elevator pitch. Okay? 
If God is starting to stir in you a mission, a task that he has for you, I want you to be able to start working on something where if you encountered someone for the first time, in 30 seconds or less, you would be able to tell them exactly what God is doing in your life. Okay, so to pick on Dave for an example, okay, Dave's got this thing where I'm a part of a church, but I'm steering missions in one particular way, and I've got this thing, and I've got this thing that I'm doing, and by the end of that 30 seconds, this guy is pumped up and say, how do I come, come along and support you in that effort? How is, how is it that you can put together something, less than a minute, that tells somebody that you've never seen before exactly what your mission is? See, we've been talking about this mission. We've been talking about this task for now three weeks, and you're starting to wonder, what is my task? What is God doing inside of me? Your story is going to be completely unique to you, okay? You've got to be preparing for the season that you are in, only you are in, because your journey is unique. You've got to be preparing Okay, remember that, that Nehemiah prayed and he fasted and he mourned. He did those three things, but then he took a leap. He decided that he was going to ask the king. So this journey of Nehemiah is, is incredibly useful to us thousands of years later. Because it shows us that when good, bad news comes, remember bad news is the genesis of breakthroughs from week, week one. We get bad news and all of a sudden there's something that we get to do. There is something that we need to do. There was something that Nehemiah needed to do. The walls of his city of origin had been completely destroyed. The, the town of Jerusalem had been completely leveled. They put the town together, but they were having a difficult time putting the wall together afterwards. And remember, the wall is what gave them identity. It's the first thing that you see when you come to the kingdom, that great wall. It gave them perspective, who they were. It gave them identity. So when they had a difficulty in rebuilding those walls, they had a difficulty in creating those spaces that they needed, identity and security and all of those things. And that's what this story is all about. That's what Nehemiah's story is for us. So this morning, there's three things that I want you to see as the story of Nehemiah begins to get real. And, and as we look at our journey, as we look at the mission that we're on, as we look at the task that God has given us, these are the three things that we need to look at. Number one, I want you to think of inviting support. Okay, so if you've already begun that mission, um, you know how important it is to have that support. I'm always thinking of the sowers. They, they had this idea of we've got this gift and we've got these opportunities. How do we blend them in so that we can do these things? They needed support. They needed supplies, which you guys came up and, and provided for them. You needed equip they needed equipment, which came into being. And this is the, exactly the story of what Nehemiah was up against. Remember that, that he had to have some things in order to build the wall. He had to have the favor of the king. He had to say to King Artaxerxes, I've got to leave and take care of this mission. He had to get that favor so that when he asked, when he asked, I need these things, when the king finally said, what do you need? He was able to say, I need favor with the king. I need some letters so that I can get safe passage. I need some lumber so that I can build the, the gates and the overhangs. I need all of those things. And when he did it, when Nehemiah finally said, this is my list, the king said what? Go to it. Now remember, that's a complication because King Artaxerxes wasn't always the best king. He wasn't always a good guy. And so that was, that was kind of maybe a scary thing for him to do. But what we need to learn this morning is that if you're going to do your mission, if you're going to do the thing that God has for you, you need to invite support. So we're in Nehemiah chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 8 this morning. And I'm going to skip around in this, so I'm going to have it on the screen for you. And you can also follow along in your Bible. I'm reading this portion out of the NIV. It says this. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. Okay? He said yes. 
Verse 11, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Ju Jerusalem. Go down to verse 13. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Jump down to verse 16. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Nehemiah is continuing to prepare. He's formulating a plan. Because although he knew by talking to his brothers what he was up against, he had to see it for himself. He had to examine it for himself. He had to think it through. He said, I set out during the night with a few others. What I want you to see here as we're looking about inviting support is the importance of a few. It's the importance of a few. There's an African proverb that says this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. We sometimes don't have a, a large enough spectrum. Our, our vision is really small. There's a book that, that is on my shelf to get to. It's called Your God is Too Small. <laughs> Does, that ring? Does that ring true for any of us? Sometimes we put God in a box that you can't accomplish that. That's too big. Nehemiah's, Nehemiah's perspective was growing as he's looking at the walls of Jerusalem. But what I also want you to see is you need the perspective of others. When God gives you a mission and you run headlong into it, sometimes it can be overwhelming if you're doing it on your own. We need to see the larger view because that view is closer to God's view. And we want to have God's perspective. I need to be able to see the project differently than me. Because when I see me, I can't see myself. Does that make sense? You can stand in front of a mirror and say, this is who I am. But it's backwards, right? It's kind of flipped around. You don't see, the, you, ever, you ever looked at a, a photograph of yourself and the mole's in the wrong place? <laughs> That's not in the right spot. Even in a mirror, we don't see ourselves the way that we are. So it's very important that we get the perspective of others. Nehemiah was influenced by people. He wasn't an expert. Okay? He wasn't a contractor. He didn't know how to do that well. Okay? He, may not know, he may not have known how to, to put the, the planks together. He may not have known how to do the whole project. So he surrounds himself, the word says, by a few other folks. Some choice men, some people who knew what the journey was going to look like. It's kind of like his personal board of directors. Right? We need... Our own kind of personal board of directors as we're getting ready to launch out on this journey. Look, these people aren't going to give you permission. That permission is going to come from God alone. Okay, if he has the mission, remember, it's, it's a mission that's from God. If the mission is from God, these people aren't going to give permission. They're going to help give you guidance. Okay, um, that's why over the next three or four weeks, you're going to hear me talk a lot about a small group. Okay, if you are not in a small group right now, I want to encourage you to get in a small group. I don't care if it's six people or 16 people. You need to be plugged into a weekly meeting small group because here's what happens if you don't. If something happens to you in your life, you may well be all alone. And in a church environment, that's not acceptable. That isn't acceptable. We want you to get plugged in. And, and here's the hard, the hard part of that is you have to do it. You have to do it. Nobody's going to find you and say, hey, I'm starting a small group. You want to be a part of it? Although that might happen. It might happen. If you don't go seeking it, 
If you don't go looking for it, you won't plug into it. And I know the importance of in a church like this, we've got this group of a lot of seniors who are already plugged into the groups that they've been in for 40 years. Okay, And then we've got a group of people who are doing that because they meet every week. But there's a large segment of us between 18 and 50 who aren't involved in a weekly thing. We have no sense of community. We have no sense of guidance. We have no sense of, of fitting into something bigger than ourselves because like Nehemiah knew, this is what I want you to see. This is a tie back to this, is that Nehemiah knew he was going to surround himself by those people. And that's where these, this happens in, in our day and age, in community, in a life group, in a small group, in a rooted group. There's no better way. There is no better way right now to get into the life of a small group than rooted right now. If you've not done rooted, you need to do rooted. You need to do it. Okay? All right. Because here's what I want you to see. And it's from Proverbs 12. Verse 15, and this is where rubber meets road. It says this, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Okay, and you can't do that if you're on your own. You can't do that if you don't have a sense of community. And it doesn't have to be an FBC group, okay? It can be another group from, made up from, of people from other churches. But here's what I want you to see. You need a few you need a few. If you have your bulletin this morning, I want you to take it out just for a minute, okay? If you have a bulletin. On the back, there's a couple of lines there that, that, you, can, that you can scribble on. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I want you to write down who are your few. Who are your few? And if there's nothing that you write there, I want you to come talk to me. I want you to, to look around and engage the folks who are around you and say, I need a few. What are you doing? Are you meeting somewhere? It, it could, because we gravitate towards certain people, right? Sometimes we gravitate to people who look like us because that's the way that we're most comfortable. I'd love a group made up of some 80-year-olds and some 18-year-olds. I'd love a group like that. But who are your few? Who are your few? Nehemiah had his few. And he walked around the walls with these people. He didn't tell anybody because he wasn't sure what the entire plan was. And here's why it's important. Proverbs 11, verse 14. This is from the message translation. Without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the better your chances. Okay, I can say that in a million different ways, but nothing says it better than Solomon. That's the way to go. Don't do it alone. You don't need their blessing, but you want their wisdom. Okay, so we want you to be building, building your own personal board. Okay, surround yourself with a few. We need to build more community. Okay, we need to build that. And that can look, that can look a lot of different ways. You can have these providential relationships where you're putting yourself strategically in a position to be around others and to influence others. That's what we need. That's, as a family, what we need. This 10 o'clock hour is an amazing time to get together and lift the name of Christ together. But what happens for the rest of the week? What happens the rest of the week? A lot of times we feel just lost and alone. And that's, that's a hard thing. So here's how it looks for me. I'm just gonna model this for you. Tuesday, Tuesday morning. Um, there's a group that's happening of some guys who look like me, some guys who are just getting started in their ministry journey, and we meet with this really old guy, okay? So there's, there's like nine or 10 guys who are in that, you know, 25 to 40, 45 range. And, and we just get together and we listen to our spiritual mentor just kind of talk to us. And it is one of my favorite hours of the week. Um, because it's, I think I'm a young hotshot and I know it all. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. And the faster I realize that, the faster, listen, listen, guys, look up here. The faster you learn that you know nothing, the faster you're going to learn something. The faster you think you know nothing, the faster you will learn something. That's what I've learned. So you need to put yourself in a position where you're learning from someone. 
okay? All you Timothys out there, you gotta have a Paul in your life, okay? And all of you Pauls out there, you need to have a Timothy, okay? Ouch moment for anybody. If you're not in a mentor relationship right now, I wanna encourage you as Foothill Bible Church to get in that relationship. Get into it. It's biblical and it's going to help. It's gonna help when guys begin and ladies begin to find out what their mission is, okay? It needs to be happening all over our church. It can happen for you. You can play either one of those roles, wherever you're jumping in in your life. If you wanna run a Rooted group, go through Rooted and learn how to do that because we need some other guys who can help do that. Greg can't do every single Rooted group, okay? I, needed some, I need some of you guys to step in and do and play that role. Okay, so here's the end of that part. Don't make excuses, make plans. Okay, right now you're thinking, but I don't have time. Make plans, don't make excuses. I don't have the resource. Don't make excuses, make plans. I don't have the wisdom. Don't make excuses, make plans. Because there are places in our church where that is lacking and we need to step up and do that for one another. Can I get an amen? Okay, thanks. If you want friends and partners and people in your sphere of influence, you've got to move in that direction. It might not take shape immediately. You might get in a small group that, I don't like these people. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Find another group. Say, I love you, the love of the Lord. Give them a hug and say, I'm going to go somewhere else. And they may be glad you're gone <laughs> once that happens. <laughs> but here... We, we have this problem where, you like my socks, um, where we don't want to take out, we don't want to take that first step because we know that we're going to fall into something. And we're worried that we might break our leg when we fall, right? Don't be worried about that because God's going to catch you when you take the step that he has ordained for you. Okay? And that's the, way, that's the way that you'll know that you got the right answer. If you take that step and you break your leg, you probably made the wrong decision. <laughs> but if you step out and God catches you, maybe the Holy Spirit's doing something. Jesus was the absolute best example of this. He modeled this so well. Okay, so for those of you, okay, Russ, you gotta plug yours here just for a second. God designed the disciples before the dawn of time, right? He knew who those 12 were gonna be. He knew, he knew the story, he knew the day, the moment, he knew every detail about it. Those guys had no idea what was about to happen when Jesus sh shouted, hey, come, drop your nets. I wanna make you fishers of men. Jesus knew that he was gonna need a small group he was going to need a small group of guys, none wiser than him, but everyone useful to the kingdom, everyone useful for the project that he had ahead for them to share the gospel, to share the good news. It was fishermen and doctors and tax collectors. And with them, he changed the world. So if you have a mission, and I, I, you, it's right there, get ready to take the step. Then, then, number two, I want you to use your words. I want you to use your words. Look at uh, this next one. Put it up there, would you? Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It's the next part of the story. Next to him. Uh, let's see. That's not going to work, is it? That's not right. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Words create worlds. Okay, so my son right now, the whole family, but my son especially, he's into the musical Hamilton, um, which, um, if you don't know, is the story of, of Alexander Hamilton. And uh, he was a wordsmith. He wrote, he wrote all of the time. 
and he just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And, and his wife at one point says, um, you're, you're creating these worlds with your words. You're creating them, and then you're erasing them and starting over. We need to be careful to use our words. Let me go back to the very beginning of the story. God used his words. He said, let there be light, and there was light. If there's any better example of using your words, that's the one. There's no better example in the word than that. God spoke, and stuff happened, right? We speak, and stuff happens. I, th I think you thought I was going to say, we speak, and nothing happens. <laughs> Listen, folks, we speak, and stuff happens. You have the ability to create worlds. You also have the ability to destroy things. You're speaking vision all the time. You're speaking your mission all the time, no matter what. Look at Proverbs verse 18, uh, 21. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. That's the message. The message, it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase, okay? Difficult, difficult journey between those two. You choose. You choose what kind of worlds you're creating. You're choosing to build up or to tear down. Um, so we, were, we went to Universal on Friday. We, we've got season passes, so we, go to, we try to go down there once a month. And it's very difficult to eat at Universal Studios, okay? It's, it's hard to eat. It's really expensive, so we bring sack lunch and stuff like that. The point you need to hear is this. At the end of the day, my daughter, seven years old, um, she probably hasn't eaten well. I took too much candy. She's had a lot of sugar, not a lot of protein. And she, at the end of the day, says, having a hard time articulate that she doesn't feel well. And at one, at one point, mom says, use your words. Use your words. I can't understand what the problem is. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the struggle that you're walking through right now. I don't understand where you are in life. Would you please tell me? Use your words. Use them. Because here's what I want you to see. We paint a picture with our words. We paint a picture. So don't be a teller. Be an inviter. Okay, Nehemiah tie coming up real quick right here. Stay tuned. Don't be a teller. You should, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. If you're serious about God, you're gonna do this. You're gonna, you're gonna do this. I, I'm doing this, so I think you ought to try this. You see how that works? See how you're building that? Now that kind of stuff was difficult in the guilt and shame-based cultures, okay? So it would have been difficult in Nehemiah's time, especially for a woman to do that. But we're living in a culture of possibility. We're living in a day and age where if you want something right now, you can call up Amazon and tomorrow, you dial up Amazon and tomorrow it's here. We live in that kind of culture, it's fast. So our words mean something, don't be a teller. Don't be a teller, be an inviter. You want to invite people into your journey. You want to invite people. Have you written some, some names on that list? Who are your few? If there's not somebody there, how do you invite somebody into that journey with you? Here's how it looks for us. For those of us who've already got the mission and we're kind of like right here, getting ready to step out into it. Got it. You got something for me. I think I see it. I'm going to go. Here's what I want you to see. Number one, invite people into a better future. You're going to invite, engage, inspire, and include. The first one is invite people into a better future. You want to engage people with the possibility. Here's the example. Look at what we're doing for kids who don't have shoes. That's just one mission. That's one mission. If every one of us had a specific thing that we were doing for God, whether it was uh, the, the, the shoes or the, the money for the, the kids or VBS, what is it that you can do? 
um, engage people with the possibility of that. Whatever your mission is, look at what I've got. Look at what God has me doing. Come on, let's go together. Would you join me? Inspire others with hope. And you want to include others with collaboration. You're going to need somebody to be a part of your journey. You're going to need somebody to be a part of your mission. They're going to need somebody to be a part of theirs. And you may, may just be that person. What if? What if God used us to change the community? Imagine, imagine when we're able to be in the elementary school environment every day and making a difference there every single day, not just on Tuesday or, or when a need arises, but every day. I see a day coming when everyone is doing something for the kingdom, when everyone has decided to step out and do what God has for them. Join me in lending your genius to the cause because I feel like God's doing something. Here's how Nehemiah paints that vision. First, he's going to present reality. He's going to present reality. He says, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. That's the present reality. That's what's happening right now. This is the urgency of the now. Then there's the future potential. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Imagine the day when that's created again, and we have our identity again, we have our security again, we have all those things in place that we need. Imagine what the future potential for your story looks. What does it look like? And then next, we want to look at the bigger purpose. The bigger purpose, Nehemiah says, will no longer be in disgrace. That's the bigger purpose. That's the why. Remember two weeks we talked about the why leading to the what? The why is what's important. Because if you know why that's breaking your heart, you're going to go do something about it. If you know why there's something missing, you know what role to fill. If you know the why, you can do what God has created in you in terms of your mission. And then you need the passion. I got none. I need help. I need help. I need, I need help. I need somebody. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Nehemiah had an amazing thing going on. He had an amazing thing going on. He sat at the foot of the king for years, years of dedicated, knocking it out of the ballpark kind of service. And now God had given him a mission. And not only that, he gave him open doors, and he gave him letters of recommendation, and he gave him all of the stuff that he needed. And there was a passion burning inside of Nehemiah. He was pumped to do. He'd already done the morning part. Now it's time to get to work. Listen, your words are doing something. Nehemiah's words were inspiring and encouraging the people around him. I can't do this by myself. I can't rebuild this wall by myself. It's too big. There's too much going into the project. Was he breaking down or was he building up? You better believe he was building up. He was building up. He was encouraging and not discouraging. He was casting a better vision. And he wasn't being a downer about the current realities. He'd already done that. He already mourned in the presence of the Lord. He said, God, why is this happening? And God shot him out like a cannon and said, this is what we're going to do. 800 miles, right? It's 800 miles. You remember the story? 800 miles between Persia and, and the city of Jerusalem. It was a long trip. They just didn't get in the car and they're there the next day. This was a journey that took months. And some of you, some of you may feel like that journey is never going to end. I'm never going to get there. When am I going to arrive? God, God, what, when, when are you going to bring the healing? When are you going to give the job? When are you going to make the bridge? So here's what I want you to see on this second point. You got to use your words in your home, even when you're tired. You got to use your words at home. And I'm tired, and sometimes my words are not the encouraging ones that I need them to be. I've got to look inside that mirror and say, hey, I've got a problem right there that I need to deal with. 
Okay, here's a hard one. You've got to use your words. Hold on, hold on. You've got to use your words on social media. Okay, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this is when I'm trying not to be accusatory to any one person and look them in the eye when I say this. You have to be careful on social media, okay? You may be frustrated as heck right now and you want to set the world straight. And you may write something that forfeits your ability to speak into the life of anyone after that. Okay, you have to be careful about your words. Even when you're responding to crazy. Okay, because you can't fix crazy. Listen, you can't fix crazy. So use your words carefully. Use your words when you're talking about politics. Be careful about your words when you're talking about the president. Okay? I don't care what side of the political aisle you sit on. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that your words bring glory to God. Okay? And, and sometimes that's difficult for us because we want to change the world. We want to fix the crazy. Be, just be careful, okay? Because here's the truth of it right here. And so, ding, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Surely it's not right. You can't be inspirational tomorrow if you're negative all day today. People aren't going to believe you, and they aren't going to follow you when you take the step out on your journey. They're not going to go with you. You've got to be careful about the words that you use. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 29. When you talk, do not say harmful things, but say what people need. Words that will help others become stronger. Then what you say will do good to those who listen to you. Use your words. Use your words. Then, when you jump in, when you get to work, here's the hard one. Number three, expect resistance. Okay? Okay, remember the context here. You have a mission from God that motivates you and matters to others. When you take that step out, if you're going the right way, you're going to meet resistance. Sometimes it may be in the form of a baseball bat to the shins. And sometimes it may be worse. It may be something somebody says to you. You're absolutely crazy and no one's going to follow you. You may hear that. You will probably hear that. Because here's, here's what we see in, this, in, in the story of Nehemiah. Verse 19. Verse 19 says this. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? <laughs> Listen, vision is easy to criticize. When you have a vision, it's easy for someone else to criticize that, but it is tough to defend. It's tough to defend. People, people have opinions. Is that breaking news for anybody? People have got opinions. People, people get threatened. Someone else is here to change things. You know, they want, to build, they want to build up their own kind of wall right there. You're not changing my life. You're not changing my world. You're not moving me. I don't trust you. You think you're better than me? Expect resistance because it will come. And it may come from others. It may come from Satan himself. Okay? But you're going to face opposition, especially, especially if you've taken the right step. Okay? That's hard because, hey, if you, take the, if you take the step and it's the wrong one, you break your leg. If you take the step and it's the right one, you're going to face... Anybody with me? Anybody with me? This is not easy. This is not easy building back the wall. This isn't easy taking a step out to do your journey. A mission from God is always met with resistance. Because you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be manipulated. And you may very well be maligned. If you stick your, if you stick your head above the crowd, someone's going to throw a rock at you. I'm just telling it like it is. Many of you know that because you've experienced 
that. If you step out in front to lead, someone's going to trip you up from behind. Just expect it. It's a part of the journey, unfortunately. But I want you to expect it. Expect it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't panic. It's part, listen, this isn't hard. It's part of the journey. The resistance that you face is part of your journey. If the journey was easy, and if you knew you were going to go straight to the goal, you wouldn't do it. Maybe you would. If you knew that opposition was going to be there, say, it's going to be too hard. That's going to be too, I don't want to do that. Remember that Jesus reminded his disciples that there was going to be opposition to the gospel. There would be, there would be opposition to it. I know I'm running late, but here, look at this. When you enter a city or town, find some worthy person there and stay in his home until you leave. When you enter that home, say, peace be with you. If the people there welcome you, let peace, let your peace stay there. But if they don't welcome you, take back the peace you wished for them. <laughs> it's what it says, right? And look, look, if you look in your Bible, those are red letters, folks. Those are red letters. That's Jesus talking right there. The, 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 the Prince of Peace said, take it back if it doesn't work, right? Whoa, that is serious stuff. Verse 14. And if, you, if a home or town refuses to welcome you or listen to you, then leave that place. Shake its dust off your feet. I tell you the truth. Jesus is telling you truth right now. On the judgment day, it'll be worse for that town than the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. Boom. Okay? Listen, your mission is going to run into some opposition. Spreading the message of the gospel is going to run you in straight into some opposition. You may very well run into something when you go through your journey right now. When you take that next step, God, God be with you because there's going to be some serious opposition to that. You might get sick. Somebody around you might not make it through. But what, what do you do? Listen, what do you do when you're misunderstood and you're manipulated and you're maligned? What do you do? You got to rely on the two things that we've discussed, okay? And here's why I said it. I want you to look at that sheet of paper that you, that you took out earlier. You see the few on there? Who are the few? Who are your few? Who's your personal board? Who's your group of people that you look to when stuff is hitting the fan and you need help? Who are those people? And then you, know, you wanna use your words. You wanna trust your few for support. You wanna get around people that give you energy and inspire you. Use your words to encourage others and to speak truth to yourself. Do you think Nehemiah ever had doubt I know he had doubt. I guarantee you he did. But he reminded himself about the, uh, about the things that were true. He said to his few, this job is worth it. This mission is worth it. This is a mission from God. God made this mission clear. He has given me favor and a clear path. Let's go. He's gotten me this far. He can get me through today. He probably got with his brothers and his few and said, okay, remind me, how did we get here? How did we get here? We heard this bad, we heard this bad news, okay? And then we mourned it and, 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 and we fasted and we prayed. And then what happened? The king gave us his blessing. He rolled the red carpet right out for us, right? God helped inspire the right people. We're making progress, right? We're getting ready to build the wall. Say some encouraging things to me. I need it today. Amen. That was Nehemiah. That was what he said. That's what we need to say as we're on this journey, journey together. You're on a mission from God. Don't get down when things get tough. Don't get down when things get tough. I want you to dig in because God is doing something amazing. He's doing something amazing. Okay? Adversity means you're right on track. 
you're right on track. You might be doing a God thing if the cause breaks your heart and you're cultivating conviction, okay? You might be doing the God thing if the mission aligns with your story and your skills. Uh Uh-huh, you see where we're going? You might be doing the God thing if God has given you favor with an influencer, okay? You might be doing a God thing if all of the resources are beginning to come together. You might be doing a God thing if there is adversity. The process of doing something great is not easy. It won't be a walk in the park. They were building cities. They were empowering people. They're changing the culture, but it wasn't easy. And you know that it is difficult today. It's hard to do that today, but God is in this and you're just getting started. Depend on some of those critical relationships. Mobilize people with the vision that God has given you. That's the key. Mobilize them with the vision that God has given to you. And brace yourself for the adventure because it is gonna be good. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. So God, even on this day where we celebrate mothers and we give thanks and praise for what you're doing inside of them and inside of us, God, we recognize that this story, this story is really about you. And it's really about the grace of your son, Jesus. And we're so thankful and grateful for that. And Lord, I know that now talking for for four weeks about what mission looks like and and what God is doing inside of us and and how he is changing and molding and shaping us into the into the people that he wants us to be and he's beginning to to put the resources together that we need to accomplish God what are you saying to us right now even in and through all of that what are you saying to us we need to hear your voice we need to hear your plan God if there's someone in this room this morning who doesn't yet have that mission from you the thing that you've inspired us to be, the things that you're inspiring us to do, would you speak to us in this moment? And God, if you've already cultivated that conviction and maybe we're just terrified to take that first step, God, would you give us the courage to do that? Would you give us the boldness to follow where you're going? Help us to achieve your ways. So God, in this moment, just speak to us. Just speak. Jesus says that the death that death could not hold him. Sin and grave are useless, they're powerless. The heavens are roaring, and even inside of you this day, he can achieve what he has for you. Really, the key for us this day is surrender to him. So God, we surrender to you in this moment. We ask that you would take the broken parts of our lives and that you would rebuild them. And Lord, that we would be fearless to take that first step for you. Lord, that you would do in us the things that only you can do. So God, we thank you in advance for what you're doing and what you will do. For these things, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.